All right, so um, we need to get started. I know people have things to do later today, so if you could please move towards the seating. Um, Trace and Prius will get started on their presentation. Um, be great. I think everybody's pretty much over here. There's some chairs up front that aren't taken, so if you would like to sit down, and you don't have a seat yet. I think I think there's some availability still. <laughs> so, um, we called this meeting and arranged it because we had been hearing a lot of different responses from residents in the area and we felt it was important that everyone involved in this process um, got to hear the feedback from the public and that since it's a public space and a public park that there's a good public input process. We really appreciate that Trace and Trias decided to work with us on that and make this presentation today. We have representation from the Parks Department here. Uh, Tony Forte is back there with the banana. Um, it's here from Parks and they're ultimately who signs off on this um, agreement between Trace and Trias and um, the city as far as we want to help people understand. Um, so he's back there. So anybody from back or has to get to today? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So, and then we have several board members of Trace and Trias that I'll let Anson go ahead and introduce here as well. <laughs> they make right. sure they introduce themselves. Thank you. Y'all feel free to move on in here. Uh, so, and could you make sure that you just introduce the rest of the board members who are here for Absolutely. Trace and Thanks. All the technology going. So, my name is Anson Seal. Uh, I'm an artist. I live here in town. I used to live in Mankey Park, about three blocks that way on Ira, and now I live about three blocks that way on uh, Burr Road. So uh, uh, we have some other board members here. Uh, Daniel Lazarine, most of you know, I think, and uh, Lewis Tarver is here in the front row. He is the, the founder of Trace and Curious, along with uh, John Wood, who's not here today, and Marshall Steves is there in the back. So uh, uh, I have a list of the rest of the board members that are in this handout. I only have four more of these handouts. This is this is quite a crowd, uh, but if you, uh, there are a lot of them uh, floating around, and a lot of the information I think is duplicated in the handout uh, that you just got the other one. So yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, talk about what our vision is, um, kind of how we got started, and uh, and where we think we're going to go from here. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So, uh, welcome to San Antonio, 1968. Um, Hemisphere was a was a fantastic thing for the city, and uh, it, you can't see it very well because of the light, but uh, there was a ton of public art uh, in Hemisphere in 68. Fabulous art from all over the world. Uh, after the fair was over, much of it was returned to the owners or galleries. Some of it fell into disrepair. And uh, this, this particular piece was by uh, Bill Bristow, my old professor at Trinity. And uh, he's, he's still around, uh, but the, the birds kind of got picked off one at a time. And so nobody was really in charge of that or, or taking care of the art, you know. Uh, this piece uh, was the poster. I mean, even famous artists were uh, in charge of the graphics for Hemisphere. This is Robert Indiana. You know his work from the Love sculpture, which uh, there was a copy of that at the McNay, I think, for a while. Maybe it's still there. It's the Love with the O. It was the postage stamp. It's a very famous one. Robert Indiana. I mean, he did the poster. <coughs> so. Um, this piece you've seen at the McNay, it's a big black piece, it's, uh, you know, uh, crosses, and uh, it stands at the McNay, very large, probably 12 feet high, 14 feet high. That's a copy. The original was at Hemisphere, and it was actually cut up to make barbecue pits. <laughs> so, you know, knowing this history about how the public art in San Antonio just kind of fritters away and, and dissolves if you don't have some kind of cohesive mechanism to keep it in place and to keep it alive and 
to keep people informed about the public art. Uh, it's pretty disappointing that we had all of these world-class sculptures in San Antonio and we're left with just a few handful that are in private hands or you know, have to be uh, recreated. So this, these are some of our uh, uh, aspirational pictures. Uh, these, this is artwork that we would love to have in San Antonio. Uh, this is the type of quality that we're talking about. You, you may recognize some of these names, Richard Serra, um, George Rickey, who has also a piece at the McNay. That's the piece in the pond that's a kinetic piece and it's kind of silver and it moves back and forth with the wind. Uh, this is Barbara Hepworth, who uh, has really, really interesting things. I think there's something in the McNay also of hers inside. Uh, Trinity has one, yeah. Andy Goldsworthy. Um, I don't know how well this is going to show up, but it's a, it's a stone wall that meanders through the countryside up in upstate New York in a, in a sculpture park there. And uh, it just meanders and goes between the trees and down into lakes and back up on the other side. It's a very engaging work. With a real respect for nature, I think. And this is one by Richard Long. It's a uh, piece of slate, I believe, uh, arranged in a circle on the ground. So, um, we, you know, these these pieces are quite expensive, and uh, we are planning to raise the money to either lease or purchase or commission pieces like this. Uh, here's another one, Ursula von Ribbensgard. She just had a, a talk at Trinity University. Amazing works. And uh, uh, if you want to see more of these, please go online and look them up. Um, so other comparable uh, sculpture parks that uh, we've been looking at around Texas and around the country, Bee Cave Sculpture Park, Laguna Gloria, both in Austin, the Texas Sculpture Garden in Frisco, and the Roy Cullen uh, Sculpture Garden in Houston are some comparable things that, that we've been looking at. These are the, the acreage of all those, seven acres, 14, four acres, 1.5 acres. Uh, and then there's the Menil Park in Houston, um, which is a good example of art that exists in a neighborhood with uh, bungalows and uh, it's in craftsman architecture. It's very similar to Mankey Park. Um, and then, of course, here's Mankey Park. It's 13.6 acres. Uh, really a, a, a very wide expanse. And uh, we think it's perfect for displaying artwork and uh, having a natural environment. I mean, the natural environment of Mankey Park is something that drew us to choose this place. And we would never do anything to, to diminish the, the natural environment. We're not talking about cutting down trees or, or anything. We want to place a sculpture with respect to nature in the park. So our first effort, as you know, is Catherine Lee up at the top of the hill. And I just wanted to give you a little, a little insight into the process that we used to place that. Um, she looks really mean in this picture, but she's a really a very nice person. Uh, we visited her studio. She, her studio is in Wimberley, Texas. And she lived in New York for many, many years. Uh, really is world famous and is in uh, a, a tremendous number of collections around the world. Uh, we did site planning with architects, and met with the board, the Mankey Park board. Uh, Showed these to Catherine and gave her some input on where we wanted to, where she thought, you know, how the pieces should be arranged. As you know, there's four sculptures, so this is kind of the plan for that. And we did some Photoshop rendering. Not going to show up very well here, but uh, the pieces as placed now look look different than the Photoshop renderings. But this was a way for us to visualize how it was going to look. And then uh, installation day came, and we had poured concrete footings in the shape, in the irregular shape of the uh, uh, sculptures and leveled them so that they'd be right 
uh, with the kind of the tilting landscape up there at the top. It doesn't tilt as much as it does, you know, when you get further down the hill, but still uneven. And then there was uh, a big crane. We came to move them in with straps. And this is this is what we have today. You can see much much better up there at the top of the hill. Um, there there were some setbacks, however. We uh, had installed lighting in all the sculptures, and we found that the lighting wasn't really very effective. It was kind of low powered, so we took all those down, uh, bought new lights, and put them back up, which was a big improvement. But uh, then apparently the uh, mowers came by and didn't see the lights and just uh, creamed them. I mean, really whacked all of them. So uh, we don't think it was vandalism. It could have been vandalism. But the, the damage to the lights was such that it looked like it was a one-shot deal and they just flew out of the ground. <laughs> and then somebody had taken them and grouped them and put them together with the sculpture. So I mean, if it was vandalism, you think they'd pull them up and take them home. So, um, and also, when we were preparing for the, uh, for the opening, we were going to have an opening with the sculpture, Catherine Lee uh, broke her arm. And so that kind of set us back. We didn't think we could do a, a good opening for that. So anyway, there, there have been some setbacks, and uh, we do still intend to uh, put signage up there. We're working on a prototype of that right now, but it's, it's not quite ready for prime time. So I wanted to give you a, uh, a little preview of the pending installations that we have. Uh, James Searle very well-known sculptor from Texas. He lives in Colorado most of the time, but uh, he is from Texas, and there's a piece of his downtown near the library in the in the new circle roundabout that you can go downtown and drive around and see. Uh, these are some other examples of, of his work. They're quite uh, naturalistic, uh, floral, and uh, so we thought that that would really go well with the with the wildflowers in the park. Uh, this is the actual sculpture. It's being loaned to us, a long-term loan by the uh, uh, Galveston, uh, sorry, Rockport, Rockport Art Center. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah. Um, the Rockport Center for the Arts was damaged in. Hurricane, Hurricane Harvey, and uh, the sculpture was slightly damaged, so it's been completely restored now, powder coated, and it's waiting for installation here in the park. Um, this is in the handout that you've got. I think there's a map, and I've got some more here if somebody didn't get one. Uh, but it shows the different locations that we have uh, outlined for inclusion of the artworks, both major artworks and minor artworks, and areas, no-go areas, for example, for the flowers, for the wildflowers. So uh, the Searles is um, slated to go into this spot right here, which I think is uh, right across the street from George Grimes' house, up here on this side. Um, it, it has uh, footings, concrete footings that'll be placed. So the sculpture stuff will stand up this far off the ground, and then I think it's uh, seven feet tall, something like that. It's not a huge sculpture, but it's uh, it's white, and I think that will uh, it'll be nicely visible against the greenery of the park. Um, and these are three very small sculptures by Jesus Morales who's from Corpus Christi. And if you don't know the work of Jesus Morales, uh, uh, it's all granite. He died several years ago, but his family was uh, uh, quite a prominent family in Corpus Christi because they had a monument company and they would do gravestones. So that's how he got started. And he, through his whole life, he continued to include his family in the, in the process of doing the sculptures. And he is also quite a well-known 
around the United States and perhaps internationally. His work is included in many, many important collections. They're, they're, I said, I told you they're, they're small and they could actually be used for seating. Uh, the generous donor who would like to give us these sculptures said that she and her children would often play on them and they're slightly kinetic. In other words, they rock a little bit back. And forth. So we'd like to include them, you know, near the near the walkway so people could rest, look at them, learn something about Jesus Morales, and also take a rest on some art. So uh, to finish up, uh, we would like to make some pledges to the, to the Mankey Park Neighborhood Association. And uh, they're listed in this handout, but I'll, I'll read them here to you. We, we pledge to curate artworks of the highest quality from local, national, and international artists. Number two, to create and maintain a master plan for placement of the artworks in the park. Number three, to protect the wildflowers and the ecosystem of the park uh, as a whole. To closely manage the number and placement of the sculptures in the park. And we have determined that between 17 and 25 sculptures is a good range uh, for the amount of acreage that we have here. To coordinate with the Parks Department on access and other park improvements, uh, five and six sort of go together here. And also, number six, to help be a catalyst, catalyst and uh, to collaborate with the city for any desired improvements, like lighting, permanent lighting, um, sidewalk improvements, that sort of thing. Those are things that, that we can't uh, accomplish on our own, nor would we want to. Uh, but that really is a more permanent part of the, of the park. And number seven, to always communicate with the Mankey Park Neighborhood Association our plans and our timelines for any significant events, like installations, deinstallations, openings, etc., etc. So this is our email address. Um, our hope is that you would communicate among yourselves and with the with the board of the neighborhood association and then please bring us any concerns that you have this is this is a working document that we've brought here today and uh, we look forward to, to working with you to, to address any concerns that you might have going forward all right thank you Anson thank you. for that presentation um, owner, if you would just come up for about a few minutes and just talk a little bit about how these sorts of processes work and the role of parks in them. Do you need to join me in these Oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, just a history with the project. That, that's great. I did. Sure. So good morning, I'm Jimmy LaFleur. I'm the Public Art Manager with the City of San Antonio's Arts and Culture Department. I'm also Mankey Park resident of Claremont. And also, um, my parents, my, my, my mother lived at this house right here on the corner, and um, she grew up in Fort Sam. And so I've been spending a lot of time with her as she's um, in her 80s, remembering the past of her growing up in this neighborhood. And, just um, really pleased to be part of this neighborhood and that's another element of context of introducing myself to, to all of you since I've only been living here for about a year. Um, so the Tricenturius group has been working for many many years in fact Lewis Tarver has served as a volunteer as the chair of the, the city's public art board for many years and this vision is something that he has talked about and, and developed a group um, really amazing group of artists and art patrons and, and the, the so the concept I'm very familiar with um, their process of trying to identify the best possible location has led them to Mankey Park and up to um, this past year our role had been essentially trying to make sure that the Parks Department was meeting with all of them and understanding 
what would be their responsibilities, what liability would the city be taking on versus what the Tres Centurias Foundation would be taking on, and then making sure that they were being um, communicating and getting the feedback from the neighborhood associations. As that has been um, the process up to, to today, um, we've also made sure that we presented to the city's arts commission and their public art committee as a briefing item. There's, there hasn't been any vote or action to bless or to approve this, because up to this point, even with the Catherine Lees, they're on loan. It's a temporary process, but we've been quite aware that the ambitions is to have a master plan and to try to work closely with the neighborhood, botanical gardens, the parks department, and really connect the um, the community and all of the, the kind of assets that are here in the neighborhood. So up to this point, we've been, you know, um, advocates and feeling that we, we like to see community-based projects come to life. And we're certainly, I'm here in a professional as well as a neighborly capacity to kind of offer whatever service I can. Happy to take any questions as any of them. Um, First of all, Francis, excuse me. Can everybody hear back there? No. Yeah, so we Let me let's let's use the. Yeah. I'm not a great. Uh, okay. right. master have. of ceremonies. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate Jimmy kind of stepping in on my behalf. I, I'm with Park Projects. I'm a landscape architect with. Uh, well, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> anybody asleep? Just come closer to us. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, I'm new with the city, relatively new, about a year. I'm a landscape architect in park projects, and um, I'm here to hear what y'all have to say about the, this project. And I defer to Jimmy because he knows the history of this much better than I. And, uh, but I'm glad to be here with you this morning. I grew up in San Antonio, not far from here. Fran, you're going to have to stand up and face people. Yeah, okay. I can barely. Of the sculpture gardens that you mentioned in your presentation, what was the land use prior to the time they were sculpture gardens? Um, I don't know. Daniel, do you know? No, I didn't have time to go into that great of a detail when we were starting to come up uh, <laughs> with these precedents. We were looking mainly at the acreage and the amount of sculptures on them because that was one of the biggest concerns that we had heard coming in so to Manning the meeting. So Park is the correct size to fit your needs. Is that basically why Mankey Park was chosen? Mankey Park is the size that it is. Uh, we don't have any needs. But we are fitting, you know, if we come up with a number of sculptures, that is, that's, we we're trying to respect what Mankey Park how it exists today. My question would be, does, does your organization know the history of this park? And how it was dedicated and what its purpose was? Yeah. Yes, we're very well, very well aware of all of the intricacies and so misconceptions about the park as well. Tell me what you think they are. I think that this is a public park. Um, it, and really, the only concrete thing that is written about the park is in the Mankey Park Master Plan, where it states that it would, one of the goals is to keep or maintain the naturalness of the park. And we don't feel that what we're doing violates that. And also in the Master Plan, there are two citations where uh, public art is recommended for Mankey Park, and parks are noted as a place for these public art installations. Okay, well, just in my opinion, uh, if it's a designated natural area, these are man-made objects and therefore they're not natural parts. Right, right? but that's, it's not designated a, a natural area. You. That's the difference between you. Anyway. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Anyone? Um, I volunteer at the Conservation Society and we actually went through the paperwork and in the deed, it just has to remain uh, open to the public, basically. That's a simplification of the wording. Um, I was surprised at that because I thought that it also included where it had to stay wild or natural, uh, but it can't be fenced off or blocked off. But um, we've always wanted it natural, so it's not a violation of the deed that gave it to the city, but it 
is the, the, the neighbors have always wanted it maintained as a natural area. And um, I, I don't, I, I hate being an art critic, I don't think a white wire thing looks that natural. I love the stone, I love the metal at the top of the hill. At first I thought it was like polished granite blocks when they first started putting them in. I was surprised that it turned out to be metal. I loved it. Um, but then, like on the, the little mocajetes, they're too small, they ought to be grouped. You know, there's, I'll stand here and be an art critic all day. But one thing, light in the middle of the night is not natural. It's not at all. I don't, I, the idea of spotlights on the sculptures, I find it questionable how many people are going to actually drive by in the middle of the night and need to see a sculpture lit up. I don't want lights ever, period, not a bit. Um, not even little ones. I think our street lighting around here is too much and that we don't need more. Those are terrible things. Uh, and um, But otherwise, this seems like it's not... I thought I was more going to be more against it. I've got to say I'm thrilled that the city has somebody monitoring the quality of... We won't ever waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on something god-awful like that. What's her name? Uh, Oh gosh, I can't think of the name of that stainless steel head. Um, and uh, huh? Is it Victoria Evans? No. no, 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 no. The thing that was supposed to go uh, at uh, uh, San Pedro Park Creek, uh, oh, okay. but San Pedro Creek Park. But um, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, but anyhow, uh, and then we had other things that one time somebody gave the city of San Antonio something that was downtown at Market and Alamo Plaza, and they couldn't get them to take it back. It was a Dallas art, and it looked like, and there's no polite way to say it, looked like a dog turd. And I would have taken my dog to the vet if I had ever found that in the backyard. There were random, a blob, a, a tall blue, brown blob with random Lego colored things sticking out. I mean, you know, we, if we, we can be sure that nothing like that will ever happen again, or plethora is the name of that abomination. But I, I'm just really thrilled that the city's going to monitor. I think that's quality. one of the promises, that's the right of the uh, <coughs> Okay, I have another question. Well, let me let somebody else hear. Go ahead. Okay, so two parts. Uh, what did y'all decide on the liability of who's going to be responsible and how are you going to keep it safe as a mother of children who will immediately try to climb that wildflower sculpture because it looks like a jungle gym or touch the hot metal or smush their fingers underneath that slightly undulating giant rock? What's going to happen? And what are any precautions being taken? Well, you know, from what I understand, and I haven't been a party to the agreement between Tristan Tourist and the Parks Department, but my understanding is that the Parks Department, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you may not even know, but this is my clearest understanding, is that there are a lot of, let's say, sports parks that in, that allow for sports facilities to take place in which they put up goal posts, they put up sporting equipment, and the parks department does not own it, but they allow it effectively to have others have their equipment and their stuff out into the park, but they have to be completely responsible for it. And so the city is responsible for, you know, for our public space. So if somebody climbs up on this tree and falls off, well, we can't, we're not going to cut all the trees down, but it could be very, it could be dangerous, but that's a public use and a public realm issue. In this regard, we don't, we have publicly funded sculptures that we sometimes put out in public space that technically could be climbable, and we try to use our um, due diligence to not put anything that we feel like would be unsafe. So this is a, any artwork that might be coming as a proposal has to be looked at from that perspective. And that's something that the Parks Department and everyone will um, kind of look really closely at. And, and, and it's something that has come to our attention as well. And so we have to look at everything from whether it's safely put in and safely installed and then safe in, in, in general. But we also have to kind of make it clear that if the city is interested in having art in public places, that you know it's going to have to be something that you can't just make everything become a monolithic 
you know, cube. Well, there, it's, there's that, but then there's also art that's functional. Right. You can made of natural items or it's permanent, like a 3D crosswalk that right. could be functional and art. Um, but I mean, we're across the street from a school, so not making that more important than having people be able to see art seems counterintuitive. Like you're dressed to go to the wrong party here. I mean, and that's one thing I will say. Kudos to the neighborhood association for getting everybody here together to hear everybody's thoughts about this because I think it's really important that everyone understand what people's concerns are and. The fact that you're bringing them up helps us weigh those concerns in a, in a really realistic way. <clears throat> so, just quickly, I am an English teacher, so words matter to me. And your presentation, which was lovely, you were using verbs that indicate that you're putting these bad boys in here. Which is great for you, but we're three questions in and we haven't had a solid answer yet. So I'm concerned that maybe the planning process needs to be put back in your court and you come back with some actual logistics that are going to answer our questions. That's my concern. What? Which questions what question? do you feel haven't so been answered? So we don't know, we haven't heard who's actually going to be responsible for the safety of our, you know, neighborhood kids on these art projects, which on the flip side of that, which she didn't bring up, who's going to protect the art? So if something happens to the art, who's going to come in and take care of that? That's our that's our responsibility. They're fully insured by Trace Insurance. So are we responsible for our kids then? So we do have a precedent for public art in other parts. Right? We are always responsible for kids. We have playgrounds. You know, it, it's a similar issue with with playgrounds, and we just installed at Pearsall Park a, a ninja warrior obstacle course, and it comes with a a definite degree of but if the ninja, danger if and the ninja warrior playground and it, it's open to falls kids over. well it no it well the city that would be a liability for the city if it falls over but it's designed to not fall over but the granite piece rocks and moves and... I, i'm the father of two young ones myself <laughs> We have to be reasonable. The same thing that you're referring to can happen with the trees that are here already. A child can climb the tree and fall down. Or go in that creek bed and get the by snake. You know, because you get so much of the wildflowers that grow so tall here. I would never let my kids run in the wildflowers because of snakes. And, and just, um, and I love it, don't get me wrong, but I'm, um, I'm supportive of that. But to be honest with you, I love that these kids over here are going to actually be able to come out and learn something from this environment and from culture. I think that's a really beautiful thing to do for them because, you know, years ago they wanted to shut this school down. It wouldn't have even been here if it wasn't for the good people who said, we got to keep our little our, our school here so that this neighborhood lives. A lot of people, families would have to move out. I mean, when I drive in and there's like all the the school bus is picking up all the kids we and you don't always see kids a lot I'll be honest with you do you see kids a lot on the weekends out here no but when the school bus comes there's like kids this tall to this tall getting on buses to go someplace and there's dozens of them that live in this area dozens of them and you wouldn't know it if it wasn't for this school and the neighborhood school so I'm excited for these guys because it's good for them they need stuff like this. I have two questions oh you got yeah, she's Sorry. Well, one, I'm just, I'm curious about, um, I guess, the infrastructure that's needed for these pieces, like the concrete uh, bases mm -hmm. and things like that, like what you'll actually be installing in the park and, you know, the permanency of that or how having it uninstalled and really what that would entail uh, for each of these pieces. And also just concerning your organization, uh, I was curious about what other parks have, have been explored. Sure. <laughs> Sticking it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> What other sure. parks yeah, have been explored, um, you know, in the city? I mean, y'all have mentioned, you know, Hemisphere and, you know, I guess some kind of tie-in between Tricentennial and your organization, but I'm just wondering, like, what other parks have been looked at besides Maggie Park? Right. So, the way we started out was looking at Hemisphere. When they tore down the convention center, there was going to be a large green area, and that was our original focus. Um, the forces that be in Hemisphere and, and developers and so forth 
uh, they weren't really that interested in having a sculpture park there. So then we looked at uh, Travis Park. For various reasons, that was not going to be good. We've looked at Maverick Park, where we're moving up Broadway now. Maverick Park, where the old train used to be. Um, didn't get much uh, much love on that. I think the city was going to put in a dog park, which still hasn't happened. But maybe it's still on the books. I don't know. Uh, and so then Mankey Park was the next uh, our next choice. <coughs> and uh, it, concerning the 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 uh, uh, footings, uh, we are considering those to be semi-permanent. In other words, they're heavy. They're staked into the ground with rebar. <laughs> But they could definitely be picked up with a forklift and hauled off, uh, you know, when it's time to return. But like I said, the Catherine Lee sculptures are on a, a three-year loan, I believe. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Manakee Park has the last natural standing and the largest natural standing of mesquites in the city. This is it. Sure. This is the only, this is the last stand. And I don't want to see anything going underneath the treed area. In other words, when you guys have sculpture, and it's city sculpture, it's generally in a, a park situation that's manicured, that's green, and in a hardscape around it. There, there is not enough hardscape to actually have these sculptures give you, you know, visual rest for the eye. You know, a little delight. Because all of this is a delight without the sculpture. And if you start bringing in trains and, and heavy equipment to load in and load out, I'm, I'm really worried about the damage that's going to be done, especially under any of these areas that are treed in our mesquites. That area out there where it's pastoral and vacant and flat, that would be a lovely delight to have something there. But nothing should go underneath these areas with these old oaks and especially the mesquites. If I could in interject, um, not not uh, protesting your point about sculptures under the trees here, but we actually do have a precedent at the Parks Department for having public art in um, not just civic or manicured spaces as you described. We recent, just last year, we ins uh, installed some lovely 12, 14 foot flower sculptures at um, uh, McAllister Park. Thank you, Jim. Um, and they're in a very natural area under a canopy in a floodplain, and they actually have an educational element to them in that they indicate levels of, of floods, previous floods. Um, we're also planning an art installation um, at Comanche uh, Lookout. Um, and so we do have a precedent for having public art in a variety of city parks. Right, but the precedent should not endanger the natural greenery that is here already. We don't want to. Anytime you dig underneath one of these large what oaks, you're hitting the oaks and you're, you're endangering the entire mott, you know, root mott that is underneath and, and joins all of these trees. There is no place where there isn't something underneath. You're going to have difficulty finding something. Do you guys have even a, put footing on it. Do you guys have a conservationist that you work with? Well, I mean, I think one of the perfect partners is and always will be the Parks Department and everybody involved. So, I mean, Anything that would become an issue or is an issue has to be thoroughly vetted before any action takes place. And I don't know, you want to, you asked about a naturalist yes, or... Yes, the naturalist, the city naturalist, urban naturalist on this project? Well, we, we have a variety of, of staff that, that we call upon. We have our... And our... have you called upon them? I don't think it's a go yet. I mean, it, it's well, not but, a, but I mean, Certainly plan, anything yeah, that would have already it's a, done it's, it's, it's a, a good question. Right it's, now. it's something we should address. Absolutely. I mean, this to if, me if anything involving like highest and best, you don't go too far. And many of you are familiar with that. Anything. I, you, I, I just want to, don't underestimate your influence on the city of San Antonio and the Parks Department. We're, you know, I am in my professional capacity. Nothing you're saying is not being ignored, and, and I think the same thing for Tony. And I'm here if, because... If, if no one is going to, especially the director of the Parks Department, say, keep moving, if this is what they're hearing, we've got to make sure that we do not, um, you know, we're not, we're not asking for a 
a blanket endorsement. We're truly wanting to understand what to do and what not to do. And, and I think that um, there's, a, there's going to be a balance of opinion for people that really like the opportunity for some artwork to be here and some who adamantly don't. And so it is a matter of trying to understand how to try to accomplish the greater good and really understand what is good, what is best for the park. Nothing other than the project up there has been done, and that is a fact. And we're not at a ribbon cutting. We're well, at a we're at a neighborhood meeting. Hmm? There is the Capini. There is the Capini. At the base of the park. Oh yes, correct. That is. Is it well sighted? It's in the mud, but you know, who goes and looks at it? We just the, uh, that's the bust of uh, By the way, we just did clean and wax the, uh, the bronze Mankey bust uh, earlier this year, so we do maintain some art. Uh, yeah, so I'll to like your to point about that. into that right quick. Um, I went to the June meeting. Well, first of all, when they put in the first one up the hill, the neighbor, all it was was in a newsletter. That's how we found out about it. It was in the newsletter. There is one statue uh, group going up at the top. Then when I go to the June meeting, you say you have identified eight spots for artworks. I'm assuming that you're going to put in eight artworks. Now you're saying 25. Do you have a number? Or you just, uh, I have a feeling that's awful dense. That's a lot of statues in this park. Are you going to stop or are you just going to keep on putting more and more art in it till you're satisfied? Or until there is no more room? I need a number. You know? The number is 17 to 25. Okay, that's right. well, that's the first I heard it. Yes, we appreciate said, that you did address that because we will have to have an ongoing well, discussion about Well, it was unclear this. when they yes, said we have I identified agree. eight spots. Yes, I was thinking, okay, I can maybe stand eight more pieces in here. Now you're up to 25, and I'm starting to think, that's a lot of art. Right. Yes, noted. There's art that I'm not particularly fond of. I particularly don't like. It's all abstract. Now, you, if you like abstract art, that's great. Do you it's have not all else? abstract because it hasn't been chosen yet. Well, the ones so far have been abstract. The first five are, so I'm, I'm just assuming here again. All right, so we have another question from George. I have a quick question. Um, I'm really glad to see people from the city here, and I need to ask a question I asked at the Neighborhood Association meeting last um, in June, and that is, how has this process conformed with the city's guidelines for public participation? And what is the city's role? Not the neighborhood association's role in pulling people together, but the city's role under what was passed by city council on public participation. And how do you guys plan to address that going forward? Well, so we, have, we do have policies in place for publicly funded public art on public property. We, are, we do not necessarily have the same measure of management of over, over projects when they're being done by private funds. We do make sure that any project, whether it's being done with any department or any property, go through a public process. And so briefings, if, if, if a briefing or an action needs to be taken, we have monthly meetings of the Public Art Committee. Those also are recommendations that are made to the San Antonio Arts Commission, which have mayor and city council, council appointed positions. So everything that we have we in, in terms of public space and public art are subject to that process. And that's where the briefing up to this point had been made to the Public Art Committee about the project and about the Parks Department and the Tres Centurias um, developing relationship. And, and up to our knowledge also, we've been listening to what is the feedback from the neighborhood. And one of the reasons why we're here today is to try to understand moving forward how are we going to get consensus and support? And what kind of level of public participation is coming from the, the, the residents? And I think that, honestly, there's a vision of from the Tres, Tres Centurius group for what they would like to see happen. But that vision takes participation from yeah, the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. What's the city's responsibility? The city's responsibility on a public space to make sure that citizens are engaged as per the guidelines passed by city council. What's the city's responsibility and what are you guys going to do about making sure people are informed about this, are allowed to participate, and not just informed about what they're going to do? Yeah, well, I think that we have um, a developing project right now. We have one installation 
and we have a, a kind of developing agreement of one piece and one installation so far, and there's a vision for more. And so I, I kind of talked to Anson and many of the others that really need to engage the neighborhood, the parks department, even potentially think about there's art in the garden at Botanical Gardens, and there's also um, the Brackenridge Park and their conservancy, and so all of this needs to be thought of together with a lot of um, maybe a, a more um, structured relationship than, than our loose, you know, kind of what a loose relationship has started. I don't know. Too. Jimmy, is the Public Art Committee meeting, is that, uh, is that an open meeting? Yeah. Okay. They're the, the first, tu first Tuesday of every month and then the Arts Commissions are the second Tuesday. So we will always be presenting our projects to the Public Art Committee and those are open meetings so anybody is um, allowed to join. What about the San Antonio Art Commission? Yeah, it's the second Tuesday of every month. That, that's, as well. the, that's the umbrella organization for the Public Art Committee. And there's the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Those may be briefed and, and, and asked to weigh in on this. And like I said before, this is our first opportunity to really get the residents to speak directly to the organization and to city representatives. And um, we want to have something that is understanding. Um, what's best for the neighborhood as well as for the city's parks. Okay, the microphone wants to recognize George. Uh, I'm George Grimes. I live on Harlan. I've lived here for a long time. Uh, and I am strongly in favor of, of this proposal. I like art. I sometimes go to the McNay or the San Antonio Museum of Art to see art. I've traveled all over the United States in part to look at art, you know, uh, paintings and sculptures and sculpture gardens and sculptures in park, and it, I would be delighted to have more art right across the street from me in this park that I can enjoy and our neighbors can enjoy. So, thanks. So, this is both a comment and a question. Um, I am currently the president of the Neighborhood Association, and the way that we found out this information about the Public Art Committee and the San Antonio Arts Commission and how this process works is because we realized that people were a very mixed opinion and that that wasn't being acknowledged in a very structured way where we could understand that feedback was sought or being listened to. So because I asked, we got the information about what the process was, and I would just like to point out that in these situations that are more of a hybrid public-private partnership thing where public funds are not used for the whole process, that just like for land use issues, zoning, board of adjustment hearings, there's a formal process now for informing the community, making sure they have the opportunity to provide feedback. Even in situations where public funds aren't being used for the entirety of the project, it's really important to release that information and have it available um, because otherwise people feel like they're not informed and they don't know what's going on unless they happen to have other committed neighbors or community members who go to the trouble of asking. So um, just a, a comment and if possible could you please um, email the Neighborhood Association the information about when those meetings are being held so we can release it to anyone in the community who chooses to attend. We got one. Who we got? I don't think we have a question. First of all I agree with George. I like the idea of the art. But I don't want paths going from one structure to the other. Also, I don't like the light idea. And are, is this going to be a live display? It, once you put something down, is it there forever? No. From my understanding, the first project was on a three-year loan. And so after that period, it could go away and maybe something else or some other plan. And, and, and up to this point, and I think Tony would agree, there's been no discussion of changing the, the park with lights or sidewalks or paths. None of that has been approved. I think that the only action was this temporary artwork, which from my understanding, there had probably been more, we had, I think we had understood maybe more feedback had been gathered from the neighborhood than, than what we're listening to today. So I think we certainly want the feedback to happen before the plans are made. And, and we don't, I think we want to try to appeal to the type of park that is currently here and, and what people want to continue to see here. 
And if that includes art installations, then it's going to be also those art installations that have been um, agreed upon. So my question is just if you if you have any information on how this increases like um, external foot traffic outside of the neighborhoods when these types of things go in, um, like in this park. We have a very like gentle amount of traffic through the actual like nature part of the park, which doesn't really create a lot of impact. Like people just walking their dog once in a while into the park and then out. Um, how how would this how would this uh, affect like people coming in, maybe parking in the neighborhood, maybe bringing maybe other events in? Do you have any information or? Um, like from other places that have similar situations, what kind of traffic does it bring in from outside? I, I don't. I mean, honestly, but I kind of hear what your question is leading towards, and yeah, I think like, that is, the, it, is it meant to draw people in so that they kind of hang out here, or just come in, take pictures, see it overflow from the botanical gardens, or is it like, are more people going to want to come, park, walk their dogs, right. and does it create like a more of an impact? on the inside of the park? I think it, Does it I, matter? I mean, I think part of the discussion is there is a neighborhood plan, There is a there, and I think that the park needs to start to understand how does the character of the park work with any changes that might be affected by adding more art and, and making sure that it's done maybe in kind of a gradual way so that not, we don't find an unwelcome surprise by, like, having, you know, um, Maybe, uh, you know, just feeling like the, the, the aesthetic of the park has, has been lost because of, of way too many um, But added. like in other areas, like for example in Houston, where they have the Manil and it's around a neighborhood, I, I've only been there once, I don't know what it's like to live there or anything like that, but do events happen there because of these sculptures? Does it, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, does it cause people to want to spend more time within that park or is it just for people that are visiting to see the art sculptures from out of town you know we don't have any plans to put on anything other than perhaps an opening for oh. the artwork we're not going to have a beer fest you know i mean <laughs> how much traffic does that bring in you know it, it's yeah. that's not in our plans we're we're about the art and 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 there, it's a good question. There may be some issues that we have to uh, that we have to address in terms of parking and things like that. But I don't think it's going to be a a huge influx of you know traffic through the. So park. you don't think that people who visit the Whitney Museum and who visit the McNay and who visit the Botanical Gardens aren't going to want to then come and visit our park I, because of the art? I hope so. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And so, the like, the department would advocate that too. I mean, we like to see people visit our parks, but I certainly don't envision hordes of people tramping across the park to see a few sculptures. It's more um, than a few. You're talking question here that's been waiting a while? I don't know if it's a question so much as a statement, because um, a lot of my questions have been answered as people have been asking them. Um, but there tends to be in these kinds of things the idea that here there is nothing and you're putting in something. Um, yeah, thanks Mary. Um, and I just want to reiterate like the value of, of um, a natural area. I mean, you say natural area, which is a little, slightly different from nature, but just as far as like having that respite from um, the rest of the city, uh, having a space where kids can, uh, like the, uh, the role of nature and playing in nature in uh, kids developing brains uh, has really, is really something that we're learning about more now. And, um, you know, my kids play in the park as is. They climb the trees, they dig in the dirt. Um, and I, I think that's really valuable. And while I do, you know, I don't hate the art, I like the sculptures at the top of the hill, I, I really don't want to see the whole park kind of filled up with art and the wildflowers and natural areas sort of cordoned off in their own little reservation. Like, I, I, I get that you like keeping the natural area, but when we're talking about... Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, 
when we're talking about, you know, adding lights and adding sidewalks and stuff, I feel like we're sort of nibbling away at the edges of what this park is now. And I'm thinking also, like, 15, 20 years down the road, is that going to be... Are, are we going to make inroads that people are then going to use to develop even further? And, um, and the one actual question I had left is, like, when these pieces, when their lease is up, um, what happens then? Uh, are you going to bring in additional new pieces, or um, are they going to get taken away? And ones that are here permanently, how do we make sure, you know, how, how long in the future do we have a plan for um, maintaining them? So what happens to the pieces, like in Hemisphere, like you were talking about? You know, I don't want, like, a sculpture covered in weeds and graffiti, you know, right. 20 years down the road that right. nobody's taken care of. Well, that's why we've organized as a Texas nonprofit corporation, so that it exists beyond all of our lifetimes, and uh, it can be passed on from one generation to the next. Uh, I, I feel like uh, there's there's a way to, to move forward with some artwork and still be respectful of this natural area. Um, I actually approve of the way that it was set up at the top of the hill. We already have Freedom Grove up there with the flagpole, with the via stop. There's already lights there. That that via stop has to be lit anyway. I think, you know, having sculptures up there where people can see it as they enter the gardens, as they come out of the gardens, as they are waiting for the bus, that's fantastic. I actually really support that. Down at the bottom of the hill, where we have all those palm trees where I'm used to. And then we have, you know, another bus stop there. And then there's the fountain, another good place to put public art. In the central sort of wild area that we have preserved here, I think um, having a bunch of artwork dotting this area is going to really change the nature of, of what we have here in the park. And that's what I keep hearing from everybody else. So just, just my comment. Everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to. Uh, have, have, have we thought about, like, because we're talking about the park in Houston that's a neighborhood, have we thought about enlisting the pocket parks? Oh. Yeah. Yes, that was a yeah. question yeah. from my end of the neighborhood, too. If uh, yeah. mm -hmm. if small pieces could be put in, it would be perfectly yeah. 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 Yeah, the pocket right. parks are... They're far more accessible because as people drive past, they're close. Yeah, they're just off of Broadway, and not, so they and the be use seen. is limited because they're really small. For other areas for our work. That's definitely something that we've talked about. Getting into this natural area. Ideally, your input on what to do and where to do it is very valuable. And, and, and like this, if this were to be a, in a publicly funded project out of our office, you know, we would be pretty much in lockstep. I have to say, even from the beginning in the process of that, this is a little different. That these are the individuals that are raising the money and putting the time together to do this as a project that's being done as a private nonprofit project, and so I can't speak on their behalf. So therefore, I can't tell them, I'm not giving them direction as a city, they can do their projects or not do their projects. And we're, but what I can say is that we can make sure that the public is responding to what they want, and I think that that's where the Parks Department comes in, is that they don't have carte blanche, you know, authority to install works. They're going to have to get approval from the Parks Department on every single piece. But the Parks Department is not us. The Parks Department is the Parks Department. Mm -hmm. you know, it's two different things. So what you're saying is we don't have a say on anything. The Parks, the parks Department has a say on it. Find a say. Well, I think... I believe the Parks Department would... We're not going to want to act against the wishes of the community at large. and. We, uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I have a terrible communication with the Parks Department as far as maintenance of this park, for one. They're hard to reach. They won't talk to you on the phone. You only can email them. They don't respond. They don't come. I have my own relationship with the Parks Department, and it's not a good one. So uh, the Parks Department needs to make themselves more accessible to Mankey Park 
because uh, right now they're they're not real high on my list. They need to make themselves much more accessible. Well, I apologize for your experience. Um, I do know that all our of our publicly funded bond projects, for instance, we have anywhere from two to four public meetings to get pu public input to engage the community. So we make a concerted effort to reach out to the community on on any of our park projects. So um, I don't know how many more questions or comments are out in the audience right now. Um, we have done a few, taken a, a few different steps through a few different means to try and get feedback up to this point because we thought that it was needed and I think we do have some concrete things that we can take away from this. Um, I want to assure you that um, as a result of this and the reason why this meeting happened is when feedback started coming in, I was like, we need to have a public input process. And we are, as a neighborhood association, are not going to do anything without making sure there is a good feedback process. Um, so uh, to that effect, because we have a lot of takeaways from this meeting, um, the conversation is going to continue. This is not the probably last opportunity for public input about this project you're going to have. Um, I made a form, so if you have thoughts, additional questions, if you want to be on a committee to continue working on this project, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, we now have a contact directly to Trace and Trace as well, so if you have additional feedback, suggestions, recommendations about the process, the art, how the art is maintained, etc., please feel free to email them please feel free to email us um, until we feel comfortable that the process is something that to the furthest extent possible people can agree on. We're going to make sure that nothing happens unless people can get on board with it. Um, so obviously there's a diversity of opinion and there's a lot of people that live in this community. So it's going to be a process to, to come up with that, but we are gonna make sure that we do our best to do that. Um, so if you would like to take a form, um, please do. We are always available via email. Um, we are now, the Trace and Trace is now available via email as well. Um, and I'm sure this conversation is gonna continue. Uh, is there any additional questions from the audience? Yes, what, what are, we gonna, are we gonna have that posted, Taylor? Just, excuse me a second, Rick. Is that gonna be posted on the uh, yes. website? Yes, we'll post it on the website. Uh, my one question is the yes or no question. Is it a uh, sculpture in front of George's house going in, yes or no? Or has it been halted? Because what happened at the top of the hill is this all happened before we even knew about it, and now it was going to be put in front of Charlotte's house and it got moved to the other side. Is it yes or no? So I halted, requested that any further installations be halted. As far as I know, that is still the case, but I do not know what when we will be installing it. Right. So that is probably priority number one to address because we do have the sculpture acquired. So okay. yes. Yeah, I didn't answer that question. But as of right now, there's not a, an immediate date that there is a planned installation And for I it. know he wants it, but he's not the only, you know, house okay. in the neighborhood. It has been acquired. Uh, we made some commitments based on some early talks that we had with the board. And uh, so it's it's in waiting. It's ready to go. Well, not as in waiting. It's going to be installed. You know what I'm saying? Because as we go through this process, I just want to see more. Right. So, yes, heart. I understand what you're saying. So, one of the things I requested be part of the plan is that uh, a consistent, yeah, a consistent process for when a sculpture is acquired, how they, how people communicate about the sculpture, how the logistics are handled, the timeline is put in place. We do not, we do not have it in place right now, but we recognize that it's needed. Okay. Thank you. One, one last thing that I think is not been addressed. Is because this is wild and because there's not a lot of traffic, the wildlife here is, is really profuse. Underneath the uh, mesquite stand is a large population of tarantulas, and you can see them going across the street and coming back. And it, it's really amazing. If you start digging holes and disrupting things, they'll go away. I and mean, they don't bite see. people. Yeah, I mean, the, the bird life is, is amazing. We have foxes, we have coyotes, we have all kinds. And this has been a safe place for them, as is Brackenridge Park is. And they have to cross that street to get over here. But they make up part of the loveliness and the beauty of this place. And if, 
it's disrupted continually by having 25 more pieces put in every few years or you dot so there's always activity here that stuff is just it's going to go away it'll go across the street to the wild places of Brackenridge Park where there is no sculpture and you notice a lot of the parks where there is a great deal even at Brack at, at, at the botanical gardens around the pond there's no sculpture you know, in the native place where it's, it's the, the Texas area, there is no sculpture. They've known not to disrupt those areas, and they've put it all around the entrances and the public places where there's a lot of activity and a lot of hardscape, where it really shows off beautifully, for one thing. And I think the pocket parks really, really should be considered. They're small. They are generally they have nice, wide you know, areas with, with no trees, and they're close to Broadway. It would make a wonderful showcase area for those and it would tie in then to the whole Broadway thing that you guys the city is trying to set up as opposed to putting them back in here where people have to dig to find them and also disrupting a lot of people that are speaking live on these streets they live here on, on Parlin and on Funston and it would be kind of a disruption to have suddenly people parking up and down the street no place and tromping all around and, and really really changing the whole nature of this. All the picnicking that goes on, especially around the holidays and stuff, so there's a substantial amount of like stuff that happens there. And ducks get run over by people mm -hmm. drive by. One time when I, I talked to them about like, can you block up that area where people are driving by, they were like, then there was a big thing about, no, we can't block it up because we can't bring caravans and barbecues and stuff. So, I don't that's think also a really good example. I mean, when yeah, but that's my my grandparents were here. My great grandparents in like 1840 and on. That area was a place where they went riding, they went swimming in the creek. There was nothing. There was nothing, and you saw the encroachment bit by bit by bit. And now it's just kind of clustered right in the middle where people are even afraid to walk because they're homeless encampments there. I mean, there are places where there's nothing. There's a couple of issues. There. Too, I realize, but I realize. But I, you know, I personally walked 19 days up from up the top of Claremont all the way to Brackenridge Park over Broadway. Yeah. You know, but and so personally, I don't, I don't think anybody. Um, I, I well, they do. They just do. I mean, I see. The, 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 uh, uh, but walking. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think anybody's going to make, I think it's good to work with the naturalists to make sure that all of that gets protected, and I think people really respect that. Um, with the committee in mind, I think that, and you're looking at me like, no, that's what you should been through this year. Can you tell us about your experiences? Oh, with the city? No, I have yeah. this part. Oh, no. Oh, there was a time when we wanted to pathway to the end. Later, we were forced to take a sidewalk and told that it was ADA acceptable because there were little jut outs. There was the time that we said, well, if you've got a sidewalk on this side, let's put one on the other side. And we were told, no, because we don't want to force people to walk into the street. I translate that to, we don't want to build a sidewalk over the ditch because it's expensive. I don't have a problem with bottom and top. But this central area, as far as I'm concerned, is sacred. And we we have to fight to keep it that way. We've always had to fight. If, if, if Maverick Park won't accept it, and if Travis Park won't accept it, and if Hemisphere won't accept it, why are you coming here? We're fourth on the list. I want the mocha head <laughs> So... We are not going to let things move forward without coming to the best consensus that we can. We are committed, no matter what happens, whatever the process is for an installation, that logistics are addressed, the timeline is addressed, feedback is addressed, information is provided. Because it is a public space, there is a lot of investment in the neighborhood, and there has been for many years, and that is absolutely essential. Um, so we have been very that when we 
you know, put a stop to things and said, you know, we need more information, we need more opportunity to talk about this, that Trace and Torres and the Parks Department got on board with that and we definitely have a path forward. So again, we're going to keep this conversation going. We're going to make sure you're informed. Please take the opportunity to continue to provide feedback um, and we will let you know as soon as we have the next steps. Thank you. All right. all. Thank you. Anybody who else? Gets these, who, who gets these forms? I'll take it. <clears throat>